Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think we're all set. Um, great, okay, well, thank you. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Um, happy rainy day, <laughs> snowy day, I don't know. Um, and um, uh, let's get going with the December 16th, 2022 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, to get things going, let me uh, offer the um, Janet, you're on tap to do the minutes today. Yes, I heard that when I listened to the recording from the last meeting. I'm very excited. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited about your excitement. <laughs> it's probably the least favorite thing for me to do, but it's good. It's it, it will build it will build character. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Appreciate that. Um, I'll just write that down. And um, we do know that um, Laura is not able to join us today. Um, so we're not expecting her, uh, but otherwise we have a full house, don't we? Yes, we um, are down Chris Brestrup as well. She's yeah, just, yeah. there's a lot on her plate right now. We've, we're down two planners. So um, she's not able to join us today. Yeah, okay, I was gonna mention that. Uh, yes, people know there's, uh, Chris's um, planning department has had some uh, people leave and uh, a lot of um, ho hope she's doing okay with with all the work that I'm sure is piling up. Uh, but just to let everybody know that she has not been able to um, provide any additional drafting. Oh, here's Jack. Okay. Um, super. Uh, she has not been able to provide any additional uh, drafting uh, for us to review today on the bylaw itself. Um, so we'll have some extra time during that period of the agenda uh, for some discussion. We thought we would probably, um, while it could fit into uh, Stephanie's updates, we'll instead uh, move a discussion about the GZA um, proposed survey uh, uh, questions uh, to the part of the agenda that was to look at the bylaws, just so we have some dedicated time to that um, and keep Stephanie's other updates um, more um, relatively shorter, I guess. Um, so, um, apologize. Let me just get myself organized with the um, my agenda here. Um, okay, so um, I guess the first order of business is to review and approve um, or suggest any amendments to the minutes of our last meeting, December 2nd. So those were included in the package um, and have people had time to review those and uh, have, does anybody have any uh, amendments or, or revisions or um, questions or concerns raised by um, the draft minutes? And let me, uh, who, who was that? That was um, Martha. Oh. Yeah, um, I apologize. Actually, I didn't, um, the draft minutes didn't go out. I apologize. Um, okay, I didn't, yeah, I didn't uh, try to remember myself. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I'm like spacing out a little bit here. Um, yeah, I didn't have an opportunity to to, uh, to review, review yet. So yeah. okay. um, they can yep. we can review them next time. Yeah, I was going to say I didn't. Um, yeah, apologize for that. It was going to look at the minutes. I, I was I was out of commission with a painfully abscessed tooth for almost a week, so that's why I was a little late getting them into Stephanie for two, a couple of days ago. Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll put that on the agenda for um, next meeting um, to review and approve. Um, hopefully, both sets of minutes uh, last week, last uh, meetings, and and this meetings. Okay. Um, so let's move on to um, staff updates. Um, Stephanie? Sure. Um, so uh, the solar bylaw rev 
uh, assessment, I'm sorry, the solar assessment review um, uh, is is been moving along. The, qu the questions have been reviewed by the ECAC who had some comments. I've received a few comments for the survey questions from a few department heads. And so today will be your turn. So the goal is to get um, those compiled and out to Adrian by early next week. And then she will gather all the comments and the feedback and she'll revise the survey questions. And then another final draft will go out for a final review um, by, by this group, the ECAC and the department heads, just to make sure that that final, final version is um, acceptable for distribution. Great. So um, again, very importantly, we want to get to that today in terms of uh, this first round of comments um, to, to Stephanie, to GCA um, for today so they can review that, but we'll be able to look at it one more time, um, maybe it, um, either prior or after our next meeting, depending on when GCA turns that around. Right. It may probably, realistically, it may be in January. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, super, thank you, Stephanie. Anything else? Um, uh, no. Okay, yeah. Not directly relevant. Yeah, to exactly. Group. Okay, great. Um, and um, yeah, is this about staff updates then, Janet? Um, just a question. So you started out saying the solar assessment, but then it sounded like you were talking about the survey. So well, the survey is for the solar assessment. It's part of the so it's it's part of the work of GZA in doing the solar assessment. Oh, okay. So it's so is there other updates on there like more technical ass assessment? Um, just we've we've met we've um, just honed in on uh, they'll be getting something you know probably a draft um, probably in early January for you to take a look at for the mapping, um, but that's you know it's it's moving along you know we've we had a subsequent meeting at the beginning of the month uh Duane was part of that as well um and Chris Brestrup was part of that as well so it's moving along I guess I I don't have too much more to add yeah I think they I mean we we'd um review their methodology which looks sound their their uh um uh their their use of of a grid grid method as opposed to a parcel method method which I think we discussed here um, at the previous meeting um, and um, then some of their methodologies with regard to uh, factors by which they'll weight different parts of the, uh, of, of land on a technical basis um, and um, that all seems sound what we'll, we're waiting for is sort of what this all <laughs> might look look like uh, with at least the uh, the first um draft of their of their assessment for um for some feedback great okay um great and um um and chris is not with us today so no no uh, updates from her right. uh yep um and i know we will have a um conversation um after we go through committee updates so we don't need an update from jack specifically on on the water report we'll, we'll dedicate some time to that um afterwards but are there any other updates from uh from committee from from people the the working group here that um uh liaise from other committees no okay um, yep, I would, nothing really from ECAC, except that we also are reviewing or have provided some review of the uh, GZA comments um, and um, um, continue to do some 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 other work, but um, um, nothing specifically related to the bylaw. Okay, um, with that, um, why don't we turn our um, attention to um, we we did have um, the opportunity to um, review and, and talk to Jack and and uh, uh, with regard to the the draft report provided by the Water Supply Protection Committee comments um, and then uh, a, a, a um, final report uh, which is greatly appreciated uh, and uh, we just touched on a little bit last week but we thought we'd spend a little bit more time. Um, 
now um, if Jack so if Jack uh, can do so uh, to um, bring us up to date, I guess on the on the report, the findings, um, the um, how you might have addressed some of our specific questions and so forth, and and uh, we can have a discussion about the findings and the outcomes and and what what this what the implications are with regard to the work of this group ahead. Yeah, if um, Stephanie wants to put up the review comments, yeah. uh, what's it? What's it called? Um, combined comments, combined, yeah. November fourth. Um, and then I'll I'll just you know hunt and pack and do the best I can in terms of how the the white paper responded to the right. questions. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Can you all see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, with regard to, uh, all right. Comment number one: Can the committee provide a summary of the key provisions in these regulations and bylaws that pertain directly or about the implication to solar development? Um, I think we, we added a paragraph, uh, and again, th these are two documents, so this is going to be hard to switch, uh, but we did kind of flush out, um, we put a paragraph in about, you know, Amherst drinking water reservoirs, uh, tributaries, wetlands, bordering, uh, natural resource areas, and the regulations that apply. Um, and then, and again, th this is beyond the scope of, of the water supply, you know, protection committee, because it, it, it goes more, you know, with regard to wetlands protection act and, and other, you know, really clean water act and, and things like that. So, uh, but there is a paragraph, uh, within the white paper that, that takes care of that. That's it. I don't know if there's any questions with regard to that or not, but. And then uh, with regard to, you know, does the federal SWPP, the SWIP, as we call it, uh, already speak to the more robust measures of monitoring required for solar development, or is this something additional that a town may need to oversee in its permitting and zoning? So I, you know, basically, we, you know, we put in there that what is the standard procedure, and and it's it is weekly monitoring or uh, site observations after you know a major you know rain event. I think that's pretty standard within the SWIPS. So that's going to be the frequency. Um, you know, it'll it'll be minimally weekly uh, during the construction of the project, and that'll be incumbent on the developer. To provide those services, you know, as as uh, proposed. <clears throat> um, then item three, when you reference post construction period, how long after construction does this period last? What is the milestone that ends this period? Uh, vegetation established, or do you suggest such inspections last for a lifetime of the project? And if so, should the frequency be extended to much longer time period, or only after large rain events? Um, I'll say, so this one, I, I, you know, I, because this is kind of like a, a shotgun sort of thing, but I know that, you know, typically when, when, um, you know, wetland restoration projects are involved, it lasts, you know, one or two years thereafter. And I think, you know, Beyond that, you know, you can you can you know rely on stabilized conditions involved, um, and so I, I can't really point and you know readily within the within the white paper how that was addressed. But it, just from personal knowledge, I know that's how it would be uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is the WSPC aware of? any solar panels on the market that would meet these requirements 
or would this provision essentially eliminate solar installations in the watersheds? I I, I believe that the the you know the uh, solar panels do not uh, you know yield leaching of PFAS at this point in time, but it's always a nice little checkpoint uh, to provide you know in front of the developer you know as part of the the bylaw. Yeah, can um, I ask about that? Because I think I put that in in there, and I didn't. I'm not sure if I saw any edits, sort of on on the. It sort of still was in your report. Um, I mean, it's pretty draconian, right? I mean, I, I, PFAS is a PFAS, I don't. I'm not an expert, but my understanding is as in PFASs are in a lot of things that you might not even know that they're in. Um, and I just. Um, um, when you say that the PFAS, the recommendation or the report suggests that, P, P, that the solar panel shouldn't include any PFAS, does that include even in the encapsulated uh, uh, stuff that's in the solar cell and the circuitry and so forth? It's well encapsulated um, because, um, I mean, it may, it may turn very well turn out that there are some PFAS in there um, just because of all the different components in there um but they're all and you know maybe may just standard practice that these array these uh, modules have some degree of these chemicals in in them uh but if to the extent that they don't leach out um i'm just i'm just a little bit concerned of a language like this it's just um if manufacturers around the world uh we're not going to change that uh and if if um if if all of a sudden developers need to find panels that don't have PFAS and that information may not even be that readily available or may turn out that <clears throat> um, just there aren't any solar panels that don't have any PFAS in it, uh, whether that's um, that's going to be a concern. Yeah, I think I think we probably should, uh, you know, um, uh, put an asterisk here and, and, and just keep that on our, our radar yeah. uh, for further uh you know uh research but my understanding is that they you know generally these things uh don't contain pfas but you know mm -hmm. i can't guarantee that but it's 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 a good question and, and worthy of uh you know additional you know assessment by by our group uh number five might this be um battery storage housing must be located above the 100 year might this be into context where the 100 year floodplain is in amherst how applicable is this to our public wells um yeah i i i i think this is this is a, a fairly um you know we're not going to put anything within the 100 year flood floodplain regardless um so i'm not sure um and again our 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 public wells are you know focused in the in the uh area of there in the south um portion of the town um but i think you know staying when we're outside of the floodplain we also you know the floodplain probably is going to be associated with um the the ribs uh protection act which is another 200 foot buffer mm -hmm. so i think this is just by the uh abundance of sort of regulations around us that th this will probably be covered but um again i can't um you know i you know uh, I can't identify a particular portion within the white paper that that we clarified this at this point. But um, if anybody has any questions at the end of this, you know, certainly bring it up and and uh, I can pull it out if if we addressed it. And then uh, drainage consideration is this. Yeah, we we provided the article. Um, it was distributed. And and again, I I think the article, um, you know, uh, 
was kind of like on a micro scale with regard to dripping from the each individual solar panel. And I think we're kind of looking at, you know, project scale uh, issues with regard to, um, you know, the, the, the runoff. And, and so, you know, it was a research paper and it, I don't know how applicable it was, but Dwayne, you had a chance to look at it. I don't know if you had any comments on it or not, but. Stephanie, could you roll it back to the question on page two? I kind of lost. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just want to remind uh, Jack that and everyone else that the paper, the article was forwarded and is part of your packet for this meeting. And it's also posted on the web page. Yeah. <clears throat> So I don't know, Dwayne, if you had any anything to add in your if you perused it or not, but um I I I looked at it. I didn't really read it enough to um uh really extract anything useful um at this point. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, I again I think we, you know, it's it's kind of incorporated yeah. um, you know, within the the white paper. Um if we go down to drinking water sources. I think Dan has his hand up, Dwayne. Oh, sorry. Oh, Dan. sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dan, you're muted. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I took a look at the article, um, and it does, it, it looks at it, um, a variety of scales um, from the sub watershed to the basin scale. Um, so it, 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 it is pretty comprehensive in that regard, but they used a SWAT model um, for this, which is highly dependent on soil type and climate. Uh, and they modeled a region of Thrace in Greece, which has a very different soil and climate from Massachusetts. So when they talk about the scales at which they see these detectable increases or decreases, referring to the question there, I would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't make any uh, inferences from the model as to what scale we would see those kinds of changes mm -hmm. amherst good yeah that's a good point dan thank you yeah okay um so on the drinking water sources um do you want to scroll up there stephanie uh All right, so why does the Atkin Reservoir watershed include almost no land in Amherst? So I think we have addressed that in past um, meetings. Um, it is what it is. Um, might you add further justification as why there's no disturbance zone around surrounding is limited to 100 feet? Why are there considerations? Jack, I'm sorry, in, Janet has her hand up. Oh, Janet, yes. So just getting back to the, I, I actually was, I did um, scan through that article and I wondered why are we reading about um, solar arrays on farmland in Greece? And so that, um, this sort of grounds me. Um, it did talk about an increase of flood risk and surface runoff and increase of discharges into rivers. And so um, I wouldn't discount that. I wouldn't, I, I didn't know why, I mean, I, you I had the same reaction as Dan in a non-scientific way, which is like, what does this have to do with Amherst where we have lots of damp soils and poor drainage and a lot more rain and vegetation. So, but I think those things are sort of good to keep in mind as possible consequences because it comes up later in Aaron Jakes's comments. So that, that's all. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, just to clarify my comment, um, I think, the conclusions that they present in the article are valid uh, that, you know, increases in runoff can occur, um, but specifically quantifying how much we expect them to occur based on the solar size, I wouldn't infer that from this article. Mm -hmm. And again, I, th I think that, you know, we would ask, you know, um, a developer to account for that. And I think um it's it you know it doesn't seem beyond um 
uh, a typical, you know, engineering hurdle to to control stormwater and and mitigate the effect of, um, you know, say, you know, farmland going to a solar field or forest going to a solar field, and we kind of uh, address that somewhat, you know, later in the in in the in the white paper. So. Um, All right, so just moving on. Uh, might you, okay, no disturbance. Okay, so so the disturbance zone there, again, we were, we're looking at real contaminant sources like septic systems and underground storage tanks. And, you know, for, for, for decades and decades, it's been, uh, you know, 100 foot buffer to private wells. And so we just accepted that because, you know, for, for the solar installation, because the contaminant sources there, we, we, we really, uh, you know, there are minimal, uh, uh, you know, known sources of runoff from solar panels. Again, these are on roofs everywhere and never has been brought up to a level of, of uh, concern. So um, with that said, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, did the committee consider the need to consider soil types and conditions as it relates to subsurface flow? So, so that that would all be taken care of in the stormwater, you know, management report for the developer. Um, it would all be accommodated. So, you know, that's that's just a project specific um, study that would have to be addressed within each individual project. Did the committee consider the role of forest cover for filtering? the groundwater moving you know not just sediment but pollutants including you know other toxic minus solar array replacing for have a significant impact on the ability uh of the forest uh you know i you know forests are good grasslands are good we're still you know there's still a uh a grass uh you know, vegetative cover around and beneath the solar panels, you know, to my experience. And that that adds a lot. The forest land is more, but I don't think it rises to the level of significant in terms of uh, pollutants, which we're talking about, you know, rainfall um, at this point. And so um, I see Jana has her hand up. So um, when I was look, comparing the draft report to the um, final report, it seemed like a lot of the concerns that Aaron, Aaron Jakes about filtration and how water moves underground through forests and you know the pros you know pros and cons of that. I mean, so question ten is really asking sort of about that, and so I was kind of I don't know if it's jumping ahead too much, but I was sort of taken aback by what was taken out of the draft report, much of which seemed to address Aaron Jake's concerns. And I was wondering why all those, all that was taken out. Um, and there's just pages missing about how water moves underground and the benefits of forests. And when you cut the forest, how, you know, all this, the soils change and, you know, all sorts of the movement of water changes, the weather changes, the transpiration changes, there's less cloud cover. Um, and so I, I just, I don't know if we should talk about that here, but I think that this question 10 really goes to the chain, the, you know, the difference between having an old forest, not old growth, but an older forest and a meadow or, um, you know, is kind of dramatic in the draft discussion that was removed and also Aaron Jake's comments. So I was super interested in that issue. Yeah, so you know, I think that we all agree that that the recharge is going to increase, uh, and the runoff is going to increase if there's a force to solar field conversion. If it's a agricultural to solar field conversion, then things are probably going to say you know pretty much the same. Although there would probably be you know slight increase in runoff, um, and perhaps you know. Uh, recharge, but all in all, these the, the factors that we're talking about for projects on the scale of 10, 20, 30 acres, uh, I think 
the our, our subcommittee didn't really feel like that rose to the level of uh, significance in terms of, you know, the uh, the water budget, you know, given that there's a valid stormwater prevention plan, you know, in place. So this, so, this question is more about filtration. Yeah, but you, what are we filtrating? You know, what, what are we, I mean, this is, this is, you know, are, are we talking, what contaminants are we talking about? So we have established that solar fields, the panels themselves do not serve as a significant contaminant, you know, source. So I guess, I guess, I guess we could talk about this more when we get to the Aaron Jake section, but it seemed to me sediments. And so I've seen, um, and so, and the report never really addressed the sediments issue, but we can wait and get back, go to, to our Aaron's part, I guess, when we get there. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, we can talk about it now, Jenna, because, you know, any development project is going to need to control stormwater by, you know, the, the you know, you know, with a SWIP, you know, so this mm -hmm. is, you know, fairly standard that any project that is disturbing, you know, greater than an acre of area is going to require a stormwater management plan um, SWIP. And, you know, so, you know, this doesn't really separate itself from any other development that we have seen, you know, uh, within the town. So um, you you obviously, you know, can follow up with another question, but I, if I'm not understanding what your question is, I, I apologize. So Martha? Yeah, just following up on that. I guess my, my concern when I try to picture this is the uh, what happens during the construction phase. I mean, I think we know that that typically one says that the acreage, and so the concern Martha. I think with contaminant, yeah. Yeah, I, I you you chopped out there. I'm sorry, um, I, I didn't hear. You can if you can repeat. Uh, yeah, that the, that uh, typically one says that the size of the disturbed area due to the construction phase is about twice the area of the eventual solar panels. So you know, 20 acres of solar panels means 40 acres of disturbed land. And so I think the concern about the the filtration and the you know contaminants and the uh, soil disturbing and so on is more about how the construction is done, and so and so maybe the question is more when we do the bylaw is there uh, are there any additional constraints that we could put in about how the construction is done or you know the care that has to be taken or so on rather than the what happens once the um, solar panels and the uh, grass are established. So uh, in response to that, I know that that the our 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 subcommittee suggested limiting uh, phases of the development. You know, maybe there's a 40 acre array that's that's approved, but we suggested implementing it in 10 acre phases. And yeah. I, I guess uh, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree with the doubling of, you know, 20 acres of disturbance for a 10 acre solar field. I, that seems like a stretch to me. Uh, well, that's but what I've read in various articles, so. Yeah, I know there'd be an access road and then, then a buffer around, but you know, in terms of actual disturbance, you know, and maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at, you know, clearing additional, uh, uh, you know, trees, if, if it's a conversion of forest land to solar field, so you know that the, the 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 panels receive the you know adequate light. Uh, that's a possibility, but it, it's going to be on a site by site um, okay. you know basis. See, Dan has his hand up. Yeah, good. Yeah, are um, solar developers required to um, submit an erosion and sediment control plan when they? Um, are installing one of these facilities and in that case would that not um 
um, provide, you know, environmental protections against um, construction related runoff issues. Correct. Yeah. They, they need to provide, you know, for the, uh, um, you know, general permit for, for construction projects, yeah. they would need to account for storm, stormwater control, uh, you know, for the construction. So um, that's all in place already. And, you know, I think for us, you know, we just emphasize the monitoring that we would like to have done mm -hmm. and the reporting and just kind of stay on top of that and, you know, provide extra measures as we deem necessary. Thank okay, you. so um, on to item 11, did the storm, did the committee uh, consider how regulations or bylaws should address the ground slope and how stormwater should be controlled or monitored? I think we discussed this and it, it doesn't really uh, relate to, to our charge. Uh, to me, I mean, I feel like this is more of a, a, a view shed issues you know, more than anything. And I think we were talking, you know, might've been the last meeting, but you can engineer anything, you know, <laughs> for any sort of environment, but, uh, you know, you, you really need to account for the, the same, you got to meet the same standards for, you know, with regard to runoff and, you know, preventing, you know, uh, you know, sedimentation, et cetera, uh, erosion within, you know, our, you know, our water bodies and, and wetlands and things like that. So, but I don't think it's going to um, come into, you know, we didn't address it. Um, this wasn't in our purview. So uh, again, battery storage, item 12 here, the committee offers specific guidance from MassDEP and cites other experts. To what extent does the committee feel that the town would need an independent independent battery expert to further evaluate the adequacy of the guidelines provided in this section. Um, you know, I get, I think we're leaning uh, on the fire department uh, for this, but, um, you know, I, I, the battery technology, I think is, has evolved um, in the last few years and just the literature, the research sort of uh, reports haven't really caught up to it, but, um, you know, there's a lot there. Um, and maybe I'll just go through these and people have, you know, uh, questions about the battery storage. I'll just answer. <clears throat> Is it possible to have the maps include a more, a few more street names to help orient? Yeah, I'm not sure what that one's about. Um, might the committee provide the number of acres of water should protect? That's going to, I think we're going to have a GIS overlay on that. Um, much of the Lawrence Swamp watershed are wet, so would it stand that solar could not be built in these areas? Yeah. So the, the DP has put out a, a guidance document there with regard to the solar. Um, I have to look at the references here, but it it, it is a heavily referenced document within within the white paper i'm just looking with the date of it um yeah maybe you know 2015 perhaps maybe 2011 but um it's geared toward um uh you know that situation with with item you know uh 15. So we, you know, we we just we we accepted that and incorporated with you know within the white paper. Um, but for battery storage, I think we put an additional and we might have doubled it. The buffer is my re my recollection uh, because of the additional sort of uh, concerns associated with battery storage versus solar panels. But you know the the whole battery storage thing, I I. You know, I, I do not envision water being applied to suppress, you know, a fire situation for battery storage. Uh, I think the, you know, sensors and, uh, 
uh, shut off mechanisms that are the, you know the new technology for these things really reduce the threat of battery storage sort of emitting contaminants uh, to the environment. Um, but again, there there are no uh, state or federal uh, guidelines on these on these features because it's a, it's such an evolving and an emerging uh, technology. So we just all need to stay on top of that. Um, any questions with regard to battery storage? Not a question, but I did want to point out that at our meeting in January, um, Chris Bascom from the fire department will be meeting with us to talk about fire safety issues around battery storage. So just a heads up that that's coming. Yeah, that'd be very helpful, sure. Uh, item 16, stormwater impacts. The white paper provides two examples uh, of solar construction that were particularly problematic and led to substantial runoff and fines. Might the committee add a bit more insight as to what went wrong with these projects and lessons learned regarding how a bylaw may prevent this bad practice or regulatory oversight in the future? Also, if there are any examples of good solar project construction practices, please reference them. Um, so I'm going, yeah, I'm, I'm looking in the paper here. Um, Jack, if I could jump in, um, that, yeah. was my, that was my question. And there wasn't really any more detail about what went wrong in Williamsburg and Southampton. And you did reference like two projects that went well, but not with any detail. So um, it was nice to know there were projects going well, but no reason, I didn't know why. So, but like what went wrong in detail, what what what, what worked well in detail? So I didn't think there was, you know, I, I kind of wanted more detail. Yeah, well, I think, you know, when something works well that, you know, there's not, there's not a lot, you know, to say, because, you know, the, the, it's a, you know, solar panels, you know, at its most, you know, base level is a construction project and construction projects are monitored, uh, you know, via, you know, a myriad of, of regulations as it is. And, and the solar panel installations kind of fall underneath those. So, but the ones that I think were problematic were a little bit, um uh, not uh well uh presented to the local um uh, you know governing uh uh bodies to, with regard to existing site conditions um so like you know the Williamsburg one was a gravel pit that hadn't any, didn't even have any established uh vegetation and you know that so that was a problem right from the get-go and so um so the solar went on top of it but i think you know regardless of whether it was solar or not there would have been a a kind of a mm -hmm. a bad scenario you know coming out of that because they just they didn't they didn't have uh proper you know characterization and uh mitigative nay you know uh measures put in place uh you know, for, for that project site. Um, yeah, I'm kind of... Uh, Martha had a question as well. Yeah, you Martha. Want, or comment. Yeah, yeah, for the, for the Williamsburg, uh, again, I mean, I know you said, Jack, you apparently have some knowledge about the conditions in the gravel pit and so on, but the only reference was to the a uh, newspaper article in the Gazette. And surely if the EPA put on a, a million dollar fine, there must be some documentation somewhere about that. And I wondered if it, if there would be just some reference that, to, to some of that documentation that, that could be provided. Yeah, well, I know, I know, I mean, I personally watched a YouTube video on, on, by the site, you know, uh, site owners with regard, 
to the situation, it came very, you know, it was very apparent to me that that the the whole permitting process was just, um, you know, um, <laughs> inadequate, you know, from 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 the beginning because it is again there's no you know pre existing conditions or they didn't account for pre existing conditions and. Um, and so, you know, that one's very unique and it was certainly a nightmare, uh, but I can't, can't imagine that scenario really being uh, encountered within Amherst. But again, you know, our bylaw want to, you know, we'll want to make sure that we understand, you know, the existing conditions uh, prior to the development. Um, did, did Williamsburg have a, a solar bylaw in place at that time? That I don't know. I mean, again, like our ZBA is handling, you know, or to this point has handled, uh, you know, solar installations in Amherst. So, uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure. So, Jack, from what just looking at it from the from the the, the role that we're playing, um, our we need to think about as we draft the bylaws and work with Chris on drafting the bylaw, we need to sort of address of whether reference to getting the right permit uh, is is sufficient uh, for our bylaw, um, or if there's anything special unique about solar that we want to pull out uh, and suggest that is above and beyond or, or something that we want to highlight uh, perhaps to stress in the permitting, um, if there's anything relevant that's different about solar construction than other construction, uh, is that my is that sort of the understanding of of sort of what our role is here in terms of uh, connecting our bylaw with already existing permitting procedures for construction projects um, in town? Yeah, I, I I don't think that that the subcommittee identified. Um, you know, major issues associated with with the solar fields, other than what is already in place from a regulatory standpoint. Um, here, I, I just pulled up the the the, the appropriate section. Um, and you know, a, a lot of it's just it's just you know, poor you know, implementation by the contractors or or a, a poor design that that slipped through. Uh, you know the 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 local permitting authority review of that. We're just you know a, any project site that allows sediment to to you know escape and and you know run off into you know um, you know public ways and you know wetland buffers and other things. I mean that that shouldn't happen for any construction project. And I think everything. Uh, is should be you know in place because this is you know we're not reinventing the wheel here um so i don't think we need to go above and beyond you know existing um you know regulations that are that are enforced by the you know clean water act weather protection act and those sorts of things so um i do I, you know i'm looking at our document now so we are noting that the you know Hampshire College had a 2.55 megawatt installation, no incidents, um, and then uh, a four megawatt array, you know, a 38 acre property uh, at uh, 340 Montague Road uh, was built in 2018, 19. Uh, you know, no instance. So I mean, this is we're not. This is you know, to me and I to to our subcommittee, this is not. Uh, you know, like a a new and unusual sort of project development. But again, you know, we are, you know, have to be wary about the, the change of a particular piece of property, you know, and its impact um, on the town, you know, from, from a, from a, you know, from the bylaw perspective.
So the Amherst Fire Department, we might even skip this section because they're going to speak with us next month. Jack, um, Janet has her hand up. Uh, hey, Janet. Oh, thanks. Um, Dwayne's question um, makes me think of something else, because I know in North Amherst, there um, that forest is sort of a pot, like a water supply protection district, but there's no particular protections. And I think the master plan sort of identified that as a forest reserve that should be protected. <laughs> So did the Water Supply Protection Committee ever look at like, oh, should we be protecting water supply from development? You know, should we should we have certain things not built on there, like not specifically soil or, but that can include houses or, you know, what any kind of development? Like, was that part of the conversation or were you just focusing on solar? And No, it, it definitely was. I mean, and, and we were going from the Mass DEP uh, guide, guidelines for solar installations you know, for, for water, uh, uh, public water supply uh, situations where they were, they were looking like within zone one, within 400 feet of a, of a um, public water supply well. And so they were, they, this is a very intimate sort of uh, situation that the, the Mass DEP looked at. And, you know, and they were, I think, uh, you know, and that's incorporated in the white paper, but the two can can, can uh, definitely co uh, coexist. Okay. So that you know, that was the mass DEPs. Um, you know, definitely came through with regard to their um, conclusions and recommendations. Okay, so you were hewing close to the D. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because we, you know, that you know, we're kind of relying on is like. You know th this this white paper. I think, and I'm I'm really happy with with it. I thought we did a lot there, and 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 actually presented it to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and they were pleased to get it and and thanked us. And um, again, we we had a lot of you know um, hydrologists, hydrogeologists, you know, involved with this, and you know, using our experience and things like that. So just um but again the the mass dp uh document with regard to solar development within water supply protection uh areas weighed heavily within the white paper and our our conclusions so i'm just going to skip the amherst fire department for now because they're going to i think speak to this Better, but we well, well I, let me let me look at it real quick here. Um, okay, well, there's no. I'm not sure what this is because there's no questions. But um, anyway, I, I don't anticipate with regard to the emergency response for. Uh, you know, a solar or battery installation that we're going to apply water. I, I think um, during the research, someone mentioned, you know, like a fire hazard, you know, but I I think when you have solar on top of, of, of a grass, um, you know, substrate there, that the potential for having a, a large sort of, uh fire event is is you know minimal compared to what might happen if you have a forest fire sort of thing i think the energy is is lacking there um but again i have you know i i, I think this is going to be more geared toward the battery storage uh situation and um you know, we'll definitely want, you know, each of the battery installations to be self-contained uh, with all the sensors and shutoff mechanisms, you know, when, when a certain temperature is, is, is sensed. And I, I believe that the technology is a different place, but again, documentation to that effect is something that we have to keep our eye on moving forward. Um, moving to Steve Roof's comment. Um, Um, so the calculations done by the town energies and climate action committee show that amount of solar energy 
needed not needed cannot come from the rooftop so yeah so that's kind of beyond our purview um yeah the these you know the cat you know we're not we're not addressing the um you know solar energy needs or you know production we're just looking at you know water um protection type issues yeah. and steve was not suggesting that you should be just um clarified the um attribution of the statement i think it towards the beginning of the report that wasn't his it came straight from the state um and and in the redraft it did it was corrected so okay yeah all right appreciate that um and martha before jack goes on do you have a comment on that Yes, yeah, so on that very sentence, I mean, the correct the correction, I mean, I agree with 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 St Steve and so on, but in the correction, the word solely or only was eliminated. And so the sentence then reads uh, that the um, uh, of course, you scroll down, but the sentence simply re reads that the uh, that the that the solar needed cannot come from rooftops and built environments as if it cannot come at all and the word only or solely needs to be inserted again i would say what page are we on that was it was back in the beginning it's it's it was the introductory paragraph no, yeah not on these uh, comments but on the on the um Report itself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the sentence that Steve was referring to, and it got corrected uh, appropriately, except that it now reads that the, you know, solar cannot come from rooftops or developed areas, and it should say cannot come only from rooftops or developed areas. It makes it sound as if you're going to disregard any developed areas totally. Yeah. So I, you know, I think we take that, you know, internally within our group. I, I don't think that we're, I don't think that we're going to do revisions to this. So, um, um, it, it's it's going to be always changing <laughs> if we would try to keep up. <laughs> so I think we just kind of, you know, it is what it is, and your comments are noted for sure, Martha. So uh, looking at Tim Randier's uh, Board of Health comment, um, okay, so his uh, item one, monitor report any issues throughout the lifespan of an installation by the operators and report to as WSPC and be a Board of Health on any impacts uh, as the project progresses on time, inspection during construction until vegetation establishment can help with managing during the initial years, but long-term monitoring stormwater impacts and soil loss should be incorporated as a solar bylaw. This will recognize impacts on a stormwater and soil loss that can be identified and addressed beyond the installation years. So, yeah, so I think, you know, one to two years beyond the installation, is kind of a standard practice, but you know, perhaps you know, the 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 working group here wants to consider checking in for every you know solar installation installation you know every maybe two years or something. Um, but yeah, a, a check in on a on some sort of annual or multi annual basis. You know, wouldn't you know? I I think would be prudent because you know things do change. So, uh, you know, we have droughts. Uh, <laughs> we have all kinds of climate phenomena to to kind of you know keep our eyes on. Uh, Janet, so this reminds me of a conversation I had um, with um, Michael D. Chiara, Chiara, um from Shootsbury. And um, he said that on their array, they were lucky to get grass after five years, that they had a lot of problems with erosion and establishing vegetation. I don't know why. And it seems like 
if the industry practice or the town practice is one to two years and the grass or the field or whatever is being planted um, isn't established, we definitely would want to take a longer view. And maybe that should be in the bylaw somehow, you know, because, if you know, if you might have some grass on that's not really, you know, controlling runoff after a year or two. And I'm not sure if there are problems in Shootsbury were slope or poor maintenance or anything like that. Yeah. But what you're saying makes sense to me because you know, a lot can, you know, a, a, it might take longer to establish some good vegetation or something could happen where there's a big storm and all of a sudden half your stuff is washed away. Well, that sounds reminiscent of the Williamsburg thing where they just didn't have the topsoil and and, and, and the ability of, of the surface soil supporting vegetation mm -hmm. there. So, you know, all that is, you know, something I think we can control, you know, within the bylaw that that you know vegetation is you know uh, establishment of vegetation is is paramount um and key to the to the erosion and control uh and you know general stormwater you know management plan for the project um and then uh, some runoff BMP should be part of the solar bala on such large, larger installations that can act as impervious cover that accelerates and counter. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, I guess um, you know, we you know, say if if you know, in my mind, uh, considering this, if we have a, you know, we we the. Um, the white paper suggested 10 acre increments. That's certainly up for, you know, discussion. But if you have 10 acre, 10 acre, and 10 acres, 30 acres, and they're all like, you know, each one is upgrading of the other, uh, you know, you know, we, we need to be diligent with regard to the runoff and the runoff that, you know, when it comes along, the, you know, the access road. It can do some, you know, cutting and things like that. So we just have to take, you know, a, a holistic sort of view of, you know, contiguous sort of, you know, so, uh, solar development, and that's that's what comes to mind, you know, for this. But, uh, you know, we, we're, impervious cover, I would not consider a solar installation as an impervious cover. There, there's grass beneath, around. And the the drip line of the solar panels, I don't think are serious enough to be, you know, erosive in terms of the velocity, uh, you know, uh, generated thereof. So, but I know things can channel along, you know, access roads and things like that. So that's, I think, what we need to be uh, mindful of. Um, And and then Martha's got a section here. Okay. I question the assumption in the initial paragraph. And okay, you I think we already did we address that. Martha, do you, maybe you just want to take over this your your comments here and I and Oh, I, as I recall, everything was pretty well addressed in the uh, okay. In your, your, You're breaking up, Martha. Uh, Discussion with us or in the reply to the uh, regarding the battery storage placement it might have a, a slightly uh, bigger no disturbance stone or something from a private well than than just the solar installation. But I don't think there's anything critical here that you haven't addressed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So moving down.
Okay, so are, they, are we getting into Aaron Jock's? I think so. Here, so I you know I just wanted to say that you know a lot of Aaron's comments were were not within the purview of the Water Supply Protection Committee. They're kind of, um, you know, other things that we would want to consider with regard to the general envir environmental impact of uh, a development. That, you know, depending on the conversion of whether it's already developed land or agricultural or forest land, you know, each of those will have a uh, a different uh, level of, of, you know, impact. So, um, but because, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, generally, I, you know, just it was the subcommittee's feeling that her her comments were, you know, th there are going to be changes, but are these changes uh, with regard to um, uh, different factors? And, and I'm just thinking like uh, temperature and and things like that. Are they significant or not? And I, you know, and I just, I think, you know, many of them are not going to 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 raise the level of significance where it would be a concern within, you know, like an environmental impact uh, study. I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be different. I mean, there's going to be good changes, and there's going to be, you know, changes that are going to, uh, uh, you know, compromise, you know, the 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 existing, you know, ecosystem. But um, And I don't know, you know, if we want to dive into it, you know, uh, right now. And we, I guess, we'd have to pull up her comments. Or are these? Um, so, do you have, or Stephanie? Are these the entirety of of Stephanie's comments? Or excuse me, Aaron's. Oh, Aaron's that's okay. <laughs> um, I did used to be Wellens administrator, so that's okay. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually, yeah, I do. I don't know how. Um, I guess I could try to do a split screen. I don't know how successful I will be. So um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this for a moment. We're on page five. So sorry. Bear with me a second here. I'll come back so you can see me fumble. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you want Aaron's references or um, well, let's see? Well, we the subcommittee went, went through her comments. We did go through her comments, and I can just from recollection kind of generally address them, but a lot of them I think need to be tabled for. Um, you know, a future meeting where we're kind of talking about. Uh, uh, Would it be you know, more helpful to go through her comments as they are in the context of the paper? Or because I have the draft that she actually right. wrote her comments in the draft, which you all received. Might that be a little easier? Yeah, Dwayne, I, you know, wh whatever you want. I mean, uh, yeah, I, maybe just to a, refresh our memory and sort of set the stage for what might we might need to discuss as well. My reaction okay. was similar to you, Jack, in terms of uh, some very good comments, but a lot of it wasn't really um, applicable to the Water Supply Protection Committee, um, but useful for us as a working group. Um, and so I would agree, maybe we can just not spend too much time on it, but just take a look at it quickly. Um, and um, uh, see where we might want to um, um, just have discussions on on some of these issues um, that she raises um, at a future meeting. So I'll share the screen with her comments on the actual paper. I think so. Okay. All right. All right. You should all be seeing that now. And Janet has a comment, by the way. She has her or has her hand up. Yeah. So I, I think we should invite Erin to come and talk about her comments because I think um, she has a lot to say. And also it's some of the stuff is not, um, her comments aren't directly in terms of the water supply questions, but a lot of them are in terms of how um, water moves through soil and organisms in soil and filtration and compaction and things like that. And so I think that, um, you know, we can sort of sit here and parse through what, is a little beyond, but all that information seems like stuff we should know as a committee. 
But I also think she, her comments were quite like, there's a lot of detail to them. I thought maybe we should have invite her in to talk about them. And what she, she, she saw missing from this report and, and information we need to know as a committee. Yeah, and to that, and Janet, I just saying like, you know, we had like, you know, three hydro hydrogeologists on the subcommittee. And so we were really focused on water resource protection. And, you know, uh, a lot of Aaron's comments were were based on more like, you know, surface water, you know, atmospheric type, uh, you know, biological impacts of that that we need to discuss. And, and so, um, but I agree, I would love to have her uh, join us. Uh, so the, if she feels so moved. Uh, one of the things that jumps out at me is sort of like a a kind of a big point, which is forested land, you know, it takes it might it it contributes water to groundwater deeper. And it kind of mitigates like if there's a drought, it, it maintains the groundwater better. If there's a lot of rain, it kind of retains it in a different way or gives off. So I think that those kind of macro comments would be super useful for us to hear. So yeah. Okay. Well, I think we addressed, you know, from a water budget perspective, I think we addressed that, you know, removal of force is going to create a higher groundwater table, uh, more runoff because we're lacking the evapotranspiration budget that the force produce. So we're going to have more recharge, more runoff. And I think that's pretty clear. So, you know, and that's what we were, you know, you know, establishing, you know, there. And then we know that the runoff can be engineered. The higher groundwater, you know, is an issue that maybe there's going to be, you know, slight increase of wetland area resulting, you know, down gradient if there is an existing wetland because of the higher recharge. Um, but the other things, I just, you know, I think there's, you know, whether things are measurable or not is, we came up as a as a question with regard to some of Aaron's comments. So this, in theory, this, there's going to be changes, but are they measurable? Are they significant? That's, I think, what the takeaway was. So Dwayne, I don't know what you want. Do you want still want to go through this? Well, let me ask um, Stephanie. I guess in one whether it would be appropriate to invite. Aaron to a meeting to, um, you know, spend an agenda topic on her um, insights, comments, um, and thoughts, not, not just specifically on this paper, but generally from her role. Um, and if that's appropriate, um, then um, whether the uh, other folks on the committee, the working group um, would uh, suggest um, that we go ahead and do that. Um, I'm all in favor of uh, hearing more um you know expertise i i can you remind me of what her role is in town erin's the wetlands administrator exactly okay so and she's uh, the staff liaison to the conservation commission yeah okay so um I, you do have other i mean you've been inviting other folks you've got chris coming from the fire department yeah, so yeah, it certainly you. makes sense to have erin come yeah. you know to invite erin yeah. to participate at a future yeah. session yep i think that would be that'd be great and probably a better way uh, to address her um, and her, you know, substantial effort to put in these comments, I think it'd be better well, to you... have a discussion with her than try to um, um, review them and how they fit into this particular report. I, I think um, they're more um, have more broad impacts than just this water supply report. So you have a meeting on January sixth. Um, would you like me to invite her for January twentieth to shoot for that date? I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will ask her if she's available. Great. We'll just need to know the meeting time because I know it, there has to be discussion about that, I think, actually today before you adjourn or at least at the next meeting. Exactly. Yeah, I plan to get to that before we adjourn uh, just to set up the next um, uh, January meetings. Yep. I guess the, the six is already set, but... Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Do you want me to go back to the document then, or was that? 
I think that might have been the comments. The, the end of the com the compiled comments, but I'm not. I can double Let check. Me look. I think that might have been all, Aaron. No, Jenny, you had some resident comment as well. Okay. There, yeah, do you want me to go? Yeah, why don't we quickly address those? Okay, so you should be seeing Jenny Callick's comments. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, concerns about fire and battery storage systems are topics in the WSPC and our group and CONCOM and perhaps other town discussions. I am passing on the materials that may be helpful. Yeah, it, we, we received her comments and, and the subcommittee, uh, you know, definitely, you know, will review them and um, it didn't really change any uh, of, uh, again, it was a lot of, with regard to the National Fire Protection Association and that we had already referenced that and they're just, they're just new articles, but the same stuff. So, um, you know, we, we didn't really alter the, the paper based on that, but I appreciated the comments for sure. Um, just seeing, uh, so the NFPA concerned about how to fight battery fires. They recently issued guidance uh, online. It's possible to view the guidance purchase required download. The journal is from the NFPA Association provide a good overview of the challenges and how the standards address them. The enormity of the challenge to deal with these fires is apparent in the journal. Uh, yep. And I thought you should share this material with staff with committees who may find it useful. So, but yeah, I mean, we're going to you know, be talking with the fire department uh, representative next meeting. So, uh, but again, I, there were some disasters, you know, 10 years ago, you know, whenever this battery technology came out and I just, I just feel like we've, we've come such a long way, you know, beyond that. Um, but so the other one revisions to 527 CMR 1.00 Massachusetts comprehensive fire safety code and relating training opportunities and new code materials, energy storage systems. The current edition includes a chapter on the battery storage systems, but the board voted to adopt the recently published NFPA section. The new language expands the scope of the chapter, address new energy storage technology, and is based on recent testing conducted by NFPA's uh, research Foundation, the increased scope addresses energy storage systems, equipment, configuration, protection steam. So there's more references. Um, again, the subcommittee, you know, took a took a brief look at that. We had already dived into what NFBA had, what, six months ago. Again, this is always going to be a uh, evolving uh, topic because it's such an emerging technology, but I, I, you know, um, the subcommittee felt like, you know, we're, the technology is moving the, you know, correct, you know, direction and, you know, some of the disasters of, you know, years ago <laughs> have been, you know, minimized. So uh, with, with, with the current technology. And Eric, Eric's comment. All right. Um, should I read all this or? Um, yeah, so, okay. So they mentioned failures there in like a third or fourth line. The number of failures are in the vast minority. I mean, again, I, I'm just throwing a number out. I think 99% of the projects are successful. Just, just, you know, because there are so many solar installations that have been constructed without uh, consequence. There have been disasters and those, those rise and, 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 uh, you know, get our attention. 
Uh, but overall, I think, um, you know, I think we know what we're doing. And, you know, there's other issues here with regard to development of, of a piece of land in general that, you know, a development, if it was, a, you know, apartment complex or something, I mean, it's just that, you know, conversion of forest land to anything is always going to be, uh, or, or agricultural land to anything is, so, you know, what we're looking at is solar impacts and, you know, what we have, the subcommittee found is like the solar uh, array is not really introducing uh, contaminants of concern. The battery storage, you know, facilities uh, are, you know, kind of increase that risk. But I think the current knowledge uh, with regard to, you know, merges response and, and uh, fire protection, all that minimizes the impacts, but it's certainly something we need to keep, you know, keep our eye on. Um, so the, you know, the reservoir areas, you know, they're, they're mapped, they are, you know, what they are. Um, uh, any, any project, you know, will, will need to uh, mitigate runoff to any surface water body, you know, it's not unique to the, to, to the, the solar rays. So, you know, there's abundance of, uh, regulations, I think that, that, uh, uh, speak to that, you know, aspect, you know, being within the, the, um, uh, uh, you know, Amherst's, uh, reservoir up there in North Amherst. Um, I, um, I think Eric provides a, a good, um, and his uh, um, colleague, I guess, provide a good uh, uh, review of, of issues. It's, a lot of it has to do with sort of this notion of risk assessment of how, <clears throat> how do you um, you know, life's full of uncertainties and there's no guarantees in life and in, in development. So how do you um, do our best to mitigate um, as fully as possible uh, situations where, as you say, Jack, the large majority of projects are fine, but a few go uh, particularly bad? Um, and how do you really, um, uh, is there a way to quantify that, look at that? regulate around carefully, keep that in mind as we develop the 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 language in the bylaw. Um, and so I think these are all things that we should um, uh, read carefully and and take into account as we as we sort of move through the through the bylaw. I don't know if there's anything here that um, Jack, you have that particularly in it got integrated into the report or or needs to be. Yeah, I, I think, you know, talking with, with the subcommittee that um, the, the aspect that it was the, the, uh, that was uh, the most concern to us was how the construction uh, was implemented and, and, and with regard to protection of the nearby, you know, wetlands and, and, and surface waters. Uh, from a groundwater perspective, it didn't raise any, you know, uh, huge concerns um, due to lack of the contaminants and just the setbacks that 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 we um, uh, suggested, you know, that 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 we do for septic systems and, and known contaminant sources. So, um, you know, I think we're looking here at more a conversion of land use which is, you know, brings into view sheds, uh, you know, screening issues, uh, access issues, that th those sorts of things. But it doesn't really uh, fall upon, uh, you know, water, you know, resource, uh, uh, you know, area of, of, of concern. But I, I see Janet has her hand up. Yeah, let's do that. And then I do want to move on and, and have uh, some time. Time is moving 
fast here. So I do want to have some time to review the uh, GZA um, survey questions um, and then have time to close out the meeting by 1.30. So Janet. So my big question was like, why did the draft report drop um, like almost two pages that, why did the final report drop almost two pages that were in the draft report? Because I thought it provided a lot of context and a lot of information. Um, it was in the, the water quality, long-term impacts of water quality. And on this is in the draft on page seven, from page seven to part of nine, it talks about forest clear cutting, erosion and climate change, and you know what the forest is doing and its impact on groundwater and weather and clear cutting. And I know we're not talking, um, you know, about it. So I just, why did that go away? Because I thought that was super useful information and, and would provide the town council and provided me with information. Like, why was that taken out? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to- um, it has a nice chart too, two charts. Long-term, uh, so the section you're referring to is long-term impacts water quality? Yeah, and in the draft on page seven, it says forest clear cutting, erosion, and climate change. And there's like a page, there's almost two pages of text that isn't in the final draft, unless it's hiding somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't see it. Um, I know we added. Um, what I'm looking at is like we added, so I'm, I'm, I guess I just. Maybe I. I don't know if you want to share your screen or or Did, am I I mean I, I printed both of these out so so maybe Stephanie can we go to page seven of the draft or page seven of the final I guess or six of the final sure just bear with me a second because I, I what I'm looking at is the draft page seven and there's a whole section on forest clear cutting erosion and climate change. Um, Do you want the draft then that Aaron had commented on? Because that would be the draft that you are maybe looking at. And then I could show the. Yeah, final. I just have. Yeah, I just have the draft without her comments. So. OK, maybe. I'm just trying to be clear of which would be best to show the final version or the draft version. Well, maybe the draft version if, if, if stuff is taken out of the final. If, Okay, let me, I'm going to open Aaron's comments again. It's possible I confuse these, but I, I don't think so. So which are the pages that you feel were taken out? I'm assuming. One impacts water quality. And it's page seven on my draft, but my draft doesn't have Aaron's comments on it. So let's just go to water quality. Okay, it's probably further down then. Yeah. Yeah, so you just you just passed it. Oh, sorry. So that red section, it says forest clear cutting erosion and climate change. I have that in the draft, but I couldn't find that section in the final. Include like the charts with the little cow. Did she put that in? Yeah. Okay, I thought that was in the um, water supply protection committee's draft. Maybe my printout just incorporated those changes, which is odd. From <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, again, that, that's more on a different uh, uh, sort of vector than what we were, you know, looking at with, with regard to, you know, water supply. So why don't, so, we, just, why don't we just leave that for when Erin comes then? I don't want to yeah, go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, let me thank Jack for that really helpful review of the of the uh, of the report and addressing and how uh, our comments were addressed. I thought that was really helpful and, and uh, did open up um, sort of ideas uh, um, for when we sort of think about the bylaw language, the bylaw referencing already existing permits, but what the bylaw might say with regard to those permits where they may we may think they are inadequate or something needs to be added. 
um, and uh, and then to um, uh, appreciate everybody's comments, um, both within our committee and <clears throat> um, it, it, from the town and from um, uh, town constituents. I think some of them who are with us uh, today. Um, so appreciate all that. Um, and Jack, thanks for the um, for the work on the subcommittee there and and bringing that to us. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, it's something we'll we'll definitely um, is an important resource for us to work with. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on to um, a um, uh, agenda topic to prepare, to discuss and uh, what feedback we want to give to GZA um, with regard to the survey draft that they've provided. Um, and I think we need to do this at a relatively high level, and then we can uh, sort of maybe articulate these to GZA. Um, and um, I do want people to understand, as Stephanie um, uh, indicated at the beginning, this is a draft. It's for our uh, uh, review and, and feedback. They will be making some, some changes here, um, and we'll have one more chance to look at it as well. So um, uh, appreciate um, folks looking at this. I think it, it, there were some comments that we've received already um, uh, with regard to sort of the, the introduction and how this survey is being um, the context of the survey. And I think there are some good comments there uh, with regard to better setting the stage um, of the of the purpose of the survey and the context of solar in um, the context around Massachusetts and, and climate change and so forth. Um, but um, may, how may be helpful to bring up the yep. survey draft? Yep. Sure. Um, I also do want to make clear that this is, you know, we're working within GZA's uh, scope of work and, and budget, uh, and so we have to be mindful of that. Uh, we're also working with the idea um, that this survey would be distributed to constituents, but not, but but be something that they would that we would get decent response back, so that it wouldn't be a survey that would require huge um, uh, commitments of individuals to respond to. Uh, so I think we want to keep that in mind as well. So, um, and I want to add to that, Duane. So these, um, there are a few things I talked to Adrian about um, following some initial comments that I received. And first that this, um, this survey really gets to solar development in general. It's not just about Groundmont Solar. This is about solar development in the community. So it's widespread opinion on solar development. So includes rooftops as well as land use for solar. Um, the questions were, at least their initial design are really to sort of get to the range of opinion. Um, they're not, you know, they're, and, they, and so that they do get to some things that might not even be feasible, but it's again, to sort of gauge where the community is um, in their response to solar development. So just that's just some initial um, feedback I wanted to give you. And then also these questions are gonna be translated. So uh, this is not to, meant to be a very long survey. It's meant to be short and experience in town has been that if you have a survey that's too long, people do not respond. So it's meant to be getting to things in a sort of um, more succinct way. So I can uh, just go over um, just what has been delivered again to Wayne's point, Dwayne's point, I'm sorry, that they are going to um, include more of an introduction. So I know that was addressed by a few people. So that will definitely be something that will go into the, into the context more. Um, so I'm going to get more to the questions. Um, so again, looking to, you know, this question is getting to um, just where people in general feel about any type of solar development, you know, um, and they're just going to be asked to, you know, to sort of reorder these statements. And again, they're not to be, it's not meant to be that incredibly specific. It's just meant to sort of get to general feelings about 
solar development. Um, for number two, I think the question, I think there were some um, clarifying questions that some people had given, and I think this will probably be revised um, as well. I mean, it's just to sort of get a sense of like, if there was going to be some other committee, would you want to be part of another committee, that kind of thing? Um, how engaged would people want to be in, in sort of, you know, moving solar forward in the town? Um, you know, we might have some kind of another solarized program. Would someone want to be part of that? That's kind of what this question is getting to. Um, that I think number three is kind of um, self-evident about if we have workshops, will people come? Maybe um, we should. Um, yep. Do you want? Do you want to just like go section by section? Sure. Uh, and and to, but just yep, to sure and just stop. Yep. Sure. Yeah, and just get some some thoughts on this. I mean, the, the general yep, outline here is that they go through these uh, general. Um, at, trying to gauge uh, general attitudes, and then and then it more goes into specifically um, was it residential, municipal, and and commercial, um, municipal and residential mm -hmm. scale development. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Janet. Janet has yeah. So, I really want to talk about this in depth, and also like are the outreach outreach to the community to to figure out what the Amherst community values are and where people prefer solar large scale solar to go i mean that's that's the purpose of the survey as far as the solar bylaw working group and it's one of our main tasks um i felt like this completely missed the mark but i also have to say and i, I feel very conflicted is this isn't on our agenda as an agenda item and so under the open meeting law we really can't discuss it um there is ample time to give notice. It's not something that we had to sneak in at the last 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever that exception is. And so I really wanna talk about this survey in depth. I really wanna talk about our community outreach because I think this survey itself and any other outreach we have is so critical to the recommendations that our committee will make to the town council and how the by, by we're gonna draft the bylaw, but it's not on our agenda. And so, we're in an open meeting law violation at this moment. And I just, I actually didn't really realize it until, you know, I thought, so I just, I just have to present that to the group. Mm -hmm. So Duane, we can put this on the um, January 6th agenda. I, I, yeah, I also- But we are, but sorry if I could, Janet, please. Um, so this was sent specifically to ECAC, Solar Bylaw Working Group and to department heads. And initially at this stage, we were honestly looking just for individual feedback. We weren't looking for um, in-depth discussion, I think because we had a gap in the agenda today is why this got moved forward. But we weren't looking for an in-depth discussion at this point today. We just wanted feedback from everyone so that Adrian could look at all of the comments, put them together, and then revise it based on the the collective feedback and then get it back to the committees. That was her approach. Mm -hmm. So I can stop well, sharing now. I mean, if we feel like we're in a violation, then I should stop sharing. I mean, to some extent, it, it, maybe it could be covered under the Stephanie's updates, but maybe it, it goes beyond that. Um, and so um, I'm not, just remind me, Stephanie, time-wise with regard to providing um, feedback to Adrian at AGZA. Um, if we have a discussion on this on January 6th, is that going to be um, workable? It's tight, um, but I think um, I think given Janet's concerns, I think it would be um, advisable to do so. And maybe, mm -hmm. and maybe we could even invite Adrian to come to that meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any... Um... Can we meet next week? I can't. I, and we don't, we'd have to legally post it. And I just, um, it's already Friday. We'd have to post it on Monday, which okay. means the meeting would have to happen on Wednesday. Is there any, um, yeah. uh, without violating any rules, um, is there any way we can, between now and the next meeting, gather comments from our working group to compile together to um, work from? on the, at the next meeting we could post comments on the in the resource page um well i 
Uh, well, first I would, yeah, I mean, I would first want to gather your comments and put them together and then I could put them in the, in the resources, but also, I mean, I think you would all want, want to see them too. I, I would say just, we should just cleaner if we just do this for the January 6th meeting. I think, I mean, to the extent that Adrian could be with us, it would, it would maybe expedite us from, we'll have a discussion that she can partake in and hear, uh, which might be more um helpful to her her and more expedient than us than trying to translate that all into written comments um that then get delivered to her later she actually now that i say that she may not be yeah. here hold on i think she's i know she's going to be on vacation yeah so she might not actually be here that week mm -hmm. she might not be available but that doesn't mean you can't you know i so i would say just we can, if people get their comments to me, I can gather them into one document from this committee. They can be part of the meeting packet for January 6th, and we can divide, we can discuss them on January 6th. Okay. Um, uh, Martha, please. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I would like to, to, to speak here. I mean, I felt extremely disappointed and frustrated by the superficial nature of the whole packet of survey questions that came out. Remember, if you ask trivial questions, you're going to get trivial answers. Whereas if you ask thoughtful questions, you'll get thoughtful answers. And it, if we want to have this be useful to, to our whole process, uh, there's got to be a different approach. I mean, I'm finding the whole process here and the lack of interaction very frustrating. And so as vice chair of this committee, I request that I have the opportunity to have some direct discussions with the uh, Adrian or whoever is the PR consultant in preparing this and be the one who coordinates feedback from our committee. I mean, Dwayne, normally this falls to you. You were a busy person. And so surely in this case, perhaps you could delegate some of the responsibility to your vice chair here. Uh, to take over part of this role from, from you. I mean, after all, I was selected for this committee in part because of my outreach experience as education officer of our professional society. And that was one of the things I had discussed with our town manager. And so I would like to have the opportunity to short circuit some of all this discussion and back and forth and bring some efficiency to the process by being able to, to interact in the meantime, between now and January 6th on this. Um, Duane, if I may, um, I would be happy to try to schedule a meeting with Martha and Adrian next week. Yeah. Um, I can reach out to her and see if we can do that. Um, but I will say that it is not um, the responsibility of the purview of a committee member to be managing the consultant. You will work with, you would have to work with me on that. Yes. So, and I'm more than happy to, but um, you cannot work directly with a consultant. It would have to be with me. Yes, and that is, that is cer certainly the case, but, you know, normally we have the, our committee chair be the one to do that. And I'm, I'm suggesting that that fall to the vice chair in this case. And obviously it's in the role of advising, consulting, making suggestions or recommendations. And, you know, obviously, Stephanie, you were the one that that's in charge of, you know, the ultimate decision making. I'm, I'm um, appreciate the um, offer or request, Martha, and uh, and certainly I'm supportive of it uh, as, as well, um, particularly with Stephanie's um, suggestion. So uh, that'd be that'd be great. I appreciate appreciate that. OK. All right. And, um, you know, I would not, uh, I mean, I'm happy to be part of that conversation as well, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think it, it it precludes me or should preclude me. I, I certainly have some ideas here as well. I, as Martha says, I, we're all busy, <laughs> um, but um, um, it'd be hard pressed for me to put um, a lot of written comments together, but a com conversation with them with Adrian, um, with Martha, with you would be would be um, really helpful. All right, okay. um, Jack, and then Mar uh, Janet. 
Oh, I think Jenny had her hand up before me, but. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, I, I, you know, I, before, so in terms of process issues, which we can discuss, um, I was take I was taken aback by this survey partly because I had seen the excellent excellent survey that the UMass Clean Energy Extension had, and I thought, of course they're going to build off of that, and so I wonder if a few of us could sit down, take that survey, take this survey, put it together, um, take the strengths of both. Um, it's the solar bylaw working group. It's our charge to find to determine the community's values and their priorities in terms of siting solar. And I feel like we get caught up into this strange thing with the um, consultant. Who's going to talk to the consultant? I think we the consultant is supposed to be helping us put together a great survey to ascertain community values. And I would like to. I want that survey to be really strong. I want it to be really great. I'm not super confident after seeing this that the consultant has an expertise in this area, but we have this amazing UMass Clean Energy Extension. It has a great focus group questions. It has packets for communities. And I'm I'm just, I just think it wouldn't take much of for two of us or three of us to sit down, put together a survey, and hand it to the consultant saying, this is why we want to know. There's not a question in here about the community values of Amherst, you know, other than, yeah, it just, I was just taken aback by the whole thing. And I, I would love to work off of the UMass extension one. And I would be happy to devote some time into that. I, I think it'd be easy because it's all written out for you to do. So I, don't, I just don't want the consultant to drive the process. I don't want the relationships. I want this committee to function as a committee and put together a great survey with a consultant, but not under the consultant schedule or expertise or whatever. I, I just feel super frustrated by that. And I feel like we have this resource, you know, in our, the unit, it's just sitting there for us to use. And that's why I sent it to everybody. Yeah. And certainly I'd be um, keen on helping out with that and, uh, and trying to bring some questions from there to, to this survey. Do, do keep in mind that that survey that we developed was, um, is obviously free for the picking, but in and of itself is is probably a bit um, uh, more extensive and longer than we can afford to offer in terms of people response rates that Stephanie got to. It wasn't meant for um, uh, this type of thing that it, it specifically. So, uh, but uh, agree with you. Um, we really worked on that um, to try to get some more nuanced questions that try to. Um, get to um, uh, preferences, uh, um, goals, and so forth um, in ways that um, uh, um, hopefully hopefully got sort of some richer response. So um, I'm keen on on um, making sure the consultant is well familiar with that and 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 uh, even parsing out some questions from there that might make sense to bring into this one. Um, and I think Martha, you're pretty familiar with that as well, or can be, and I am, and and uh, we can. Um, it might be helpful, Stephanie, to to just make sure Andrian knows that um, is be able to, able to review that before we meet. Yeah, he hasn't already. All right, Jack um, has a question. Yeah, okay, Jack. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, I I, I kind of gleamed over the survey. Dwayne, that your your group produced, and <laughs> I'm just I'm just thinking like the, the number of neighbors uh, that I have that would be able to complete it, you know, in any sort of qualified sense because it was super technical. I, I just think the average <laughs> the average uh, you know citizen of Amherst would just would draw a blank to so many of these things. So. Uh, but that's one. But I was also just kind of wanting to, you know, because of uh, 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 my my mental limitations. <laughs> but <laughs> I just want to know, drill down, you know, Martha and Janet, what specifically are are you are you you know getting at with regard to the the deficiencies of the GZA survey? Because, um, you know, I'm not a survey expert, and I know that's a total 
you know, it's it's a career for for many people, and, and there's an art to it, and and so I want to respect that. But um, I'm just wondering, again, specific sort of how is this deficient? What were what has been, <clears throat> you know, drafted? Yeah, could would you like me to? Can I um can yeah, I just make a comment definitely. really quickly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, because one of the things I want to address about the questioning is that, um, and really to Jack's point is these surveys have a tendency to be targeted to a particular demographic. And in this case, the survey is meant to be accessible to everybody. And in a lot of cases, that's not what happens. So even the process that I've talked about when we talked about having community gatherings, we're talking about making things available for people who might not even be able to read and write English. We're wanting to have interpretation. We're wanting people to be able to use pictures if they have to, so that they can maybe identify what's important to them. So these questions are meant to just get a kind of range of response. It's not meant to be, um, you do not want a solar development in your backyard because, um, you know, of X, Y, Z reason. It's meant to be general. Um, and the the way the questions are very intentionally worded is to sort of get that range of opinion. So, and and I would say to um, identifying where ground mount solar can go, I would really caution you as to how you're developing the solar bylaw, because from what Jonathan Murray said, yeah. you cannot be, the, if you're coming at it with an approach of being restrictive, then you're lining us up for a court case. I mean, that's just the direction you're going in if that's what you're, how you're thinking about it. So I would really encourage you um, to be a little more broad-minded about this particular approach by this consultant. Um, so that that's all I wanted to say. And and also, again, this is a draft. We're looking for feedback. This isn't the final survey. So your strong responses, I get them, but you know, take a deep breath because we're looking for this kind of feedback so that she can revise it. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's finish with Martha and then I want to um I just give a, give an example maybe in response to Jack. When the uh the consultant made some questions for the for our town staff. And so I liked a little better the way they put it there. For instance, the, the question was to increasing solar development in Amherst and left a blank for you to say what you wanted. And what Martha, you, you cut out. I think you have to repeat what you said. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry, hold this I'll solve this stuff. Right. I gotta go. Bye. Bye, Robert. <laughs> yes. So Thank you. Survey to town staff, a question was asked. It said, what are my top one to three concerns relative to All right, not good, not good, good yeah. service in Northwestern so, Washington? <laughs> development in Amherst and letter then. Yeah, but I mean, but it's better than having just kind of, oh, do I like solar rays? Are they ugly? Are they this? Are they that? Because that doesn't give us anything useful. Do you see the difference? Yeah, I, I, you cut out. I think you know sometimes using your cell phone uh, in addition no, I, to the, I, I the video it. might might be a a. a well, I think we got we got the gist, and I actually have a very hard stop at one thirty. So um, okay, uh, um, let's let's move on if we can, Stephanie. I'm in rural Washington. State, right. and so I, I uh, okay, Stephanie. If we can open it up to any public comments, um, for sure. just brief comments, that would be great. So, if anyone in the public wants to make a comment, please um, electronically raise your hand and I will allow you to speak. Eric, go ahead. You can unmute. Hello, th uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. I want to, first of all, thank the committee for its really um, sedulous work on behalf of the water supply in town. I think there's really quite, uh, frankly, nothing more important than having clean, uh, potable water that we can count on. Um, I wanted to ask, a I'll make a couple of observations. First of all, how this 
committee's work and that of the ECAC and CONCOM and, and the Water Supply Protection Committee, how the work um, of each committee interfaces with the town's master plan that after about seven or eight years was, was adopted by the town council in 2018, I believe. And the, um, one of the, uh, um, um, the, and one of the master plan areas was watershed protection philosophy. And it, um, it is stated very clearly that even with a large amount of preserved land surrounding Amherst surface water supplies, minimal changes in the land use, impervious surface coverage and forested land within a watershed can greatly alter water quality. Scattered development and frontage lot construction threaten Amherst drinking water. That's the first thing, how, how the work of this committee interfaces with the overall, I would hope, governing um, master plan. Um, secondly, um, I live in North Amherst and North Amherst, um, based on the Water Supply Protection Committee's report, um, is has the largest percentage of well-driven, well-based uh, private homes in, um, in the town, uh, upwards of 5% of the, 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 of the towns in uh, the, the houses in Amherst rely on uh, wells and mostly they are in North Amherst. I would also make an observation that to date, the, the, um, the largest number of, of solar fields and battery uh, projects are located in North Amherst. So I think it, um, I'm concerned because the most of the work of the Water Supply Protection Committee and the draft report really looks at public drinking water. And unfortunately, the Board of Health was supposed to have a seat at the table of the water supply in this uh, solar bio working group, and they declined to sit around um, and, uh, and think through implications of of, of uh, large scale solar on private wells because they have, they are the regulators and the protectors of the private well systems, not the Water Supply Protection Committee, it's the Board of Health. And uh, a couple of other observations. Um, I would say that the fact that the Water Supply Protection Committee's report says we can rely on a hundred foot buffer um, from well systems regarding solar fields Things have, th and that that has been the kind of the operating standard for quite quite for decades. And I would say that things are changing drastically; they're changing every year. So to rely, I think it's too backward a look rather than forward looking. I would also say that, and uh, I think Jack, you mentioned that we're not we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, but I think that climate change is forcing us to reinvent the wheel. And so I would say that that is, we really can't just rely on what we see in our rear view mirror as, as correct operating uh, policies. And finally, um, Tim Randier's uh, comment from the Board of Health um, really does not, and given that they are the protectors of the well systems and, and Amherst does not, does really does not at all relate at all to uh, the private well systems and that, as a private well uh, system owner, I'm concerned um, that we really need to look at quality water supply in general and also in, include that, not only public water supply, but private water supplies. So, um, but again, I'm th very thankful that you're looking at this, uh, this very, very serious issue very seriously. So th again, thank you for your work. Thank you, um, Eric. Um, Jack, did you have a response to that? Or did you, I see your hand up, but yeah, I just I just want to say that that I I I, I you know uh, make want to make sure that we don't uh, consider solar fields as an impervious sort of yeah. uh, development. It's far from that. Uh, it, it is not even remotely, you know. Uh, you know, close to like a parking lot or buildings or things like that. It, it's it's it, it's more analogous to to uh, a grassy field, um, and so 
that that that's you know i hope i hope we all are clear on that point uh but also you know with with the private well supplies i think we're respectful of that um and and again i mean you know if if septic systems i think are um you know that's the standard that that we have to respect and 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 that's that's been in 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 place for for many many years and it's 100 feet uh you know from a septic system to a private well and in the septic system who knows what goes into a someone's <laughs> septic system but we have established that a solar field does not have known contaminant sources uh you know qualified that they don't you know bring in pfas and uh, and other things and then we've already you know uh, suggested you know doubling the the setbacks for for battery storage so i just want to make that um uh, um that clear and in by by i'm respectful of someone that's on a private well and and uh but i just want to make sure that we were clear on the impervious statement and and what the current regulations you know for setbacks of known contaminant sources uh are within the state of massachusetts commonwealth Great. Massachusetts. Yep. Thanks, Jack. Um, okay, great. Um, Stephanie, I don't see any more comments. I don't you, see anybody. Raised, else, anyone yeah. else has their hand raised? Nope. Okay, so, seeing none, let's, and we're at time. Uh, so um, adjourn the meeting. We will be meeting next um, on June 6th. January 6th. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever that's a really long time the day yeah. the day. Uh, time is the are we going to stick with the 11 30 for that meeting um i'm flexible so um come come that time so um uh does that I'm work for you dan say it again does that work for dan because i thought he had constraints too i'm sorry what's the time 11.30 on January 6th. Well, Just, we could go back to one. 11.30 is good for yeah. me. Okay. That's fine. Uh, 11.30 is good? Okay. okay. And the uh, the fire, is it the fire chief or somebody from the fire? Uh, it's it's a, a firefighter for the right. town. Um, and so, yes, I'll invite Chris. And then Erin for the 20th, if she's available. Great. Yep. And, and in the and, meantime, I'll also schedule with Adrian. Exactly. And okay. Martha, and we'll, coordinate. we'll have a um, agenda item on the um, on the survey on the sixth as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Stephanie, uh, before you sign us all off the meeting, maybe you and I could just speak briefly about the schedule. Um, why don't I? Um, I have to end the meeting. So, yeah, let me just end the meeting. Yeah, and you can you can follow up uh, separately. Yeah, Martha, I'll, I'll follow up with you separately. Okay, okay. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Have a great break, and thanks everybody yes, thank for all the all the hard work. Yeah. And we'll be back. Uh, see you in Jan January. Bye bye. Bye. Sounds good. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Merry holiday. <laughs>